Hi, rockers. This time around, I've decided to rank the studio albums by the Canadian rock band, The Guess Who. I've always been fond of the songs I'd hear from them on the radio growing up, and starting late into my time at college, I began tracking down their albums. I've grown to appreciate the band's growth during their original run, from garage rock to pop rock and psychedelia, to a more Heartland-oriented sound. I finished collecting all their studio albums about six years ago, including the Reunion Era albums released under the band name. However, this ranking video will only be covering the core albums released up through the band's first breakup in 1975. So, no Reunion albums, no compilations, and that includes the way they were. And as always, this is my opinion, not yours. And my rankings aren't purely based on the album's chart and critical performances. Sometimes weaker performing albums vibe better with me. If you want the facts on how acclaimed they are, go to another channel, or better yet, check one of the dozens of sites that keep track of those numbers. Let's dive in. Number 16, A Wild Pair. This was an odd promotional album done for a Coca-Cola sweepstakes, and only half of this album is the Guess Who. The rest is a group called the Staccatos, better known as the one-hit wonder, five-man electrical band in later years. Given its status, one could be forgiven for not acknowledging its existence. I actually got a hold of the five songs through a compilation album, but I'm going to judge them here based on their own merits. They're very much in the pop rock vein of what they'd release on Wheatfield Soul a year later, but they're not the band's strongest. The ballads are the stronger tracks here. I'd say these songs are not essential, but harmless. Number 15, Flavors. With a title like that, you'd expect it to be more in the vein of what road food sounds like. Unfortunately, that's not entirely the case. Stylistically, the band experiments here and there. Funk rock slash disco on Digging Yourself, slow jazz pop on I, and so on. I hate to say it, but the songs here just aren't as attention-getting as on previous albums. It's not a terrible album by any means, but it really doesn't stand out. Except for maybe the fact that it sounds like Burton Cummings cannibalized Running Back to Saskatoon to give us the album's opening track, Dance and Fool. Number 14, Power in the Music. This is the band's final hurrah before Burton Cummings left and the rest of the band disintegrated for a few years. The musical direction here is definitely pulling in several directions at once. Heartland Rock makes up the strongest material, but there's also jazz rock and pop rock ballads, and on this album, the stylistic shifts clash rather than harmonize. It's such a shame. The musicianship here is still superb. If the band had focused more on a singular musical direction, this album could have been much better. Number 13, number 10. This album took a few listens for the songs to grow on me, and I feel it's a bit of an underdog in their discography. Aside from a misstep on their part with the anti-glam piece Glamour Boy, though, it's a fairly solid record. Stylistically, there's a few side trips into country, but the rockers remain the strongest material. Sadly, it's a little overshadowed by the albums that immediately preceded and followed it with it having a middle child status given the band had the same lineup across all three albums. Number 12, Shaken All Over. I'll admit getting this album was a bit odd, as I had to buy two different versions to pick up all the tracks that comprise the Canadian and American track listings. It's a solid piece of garage rock, although I doubt many people were fooled by the attempts to garner more attention by using the Guess Who moniker instead of the band's actual name at the time, Chad Allen and the Expressions. Nonetheless, the original songs point toward what was to come on their other early albums, as both Chad Allen and Randy Bachman became more prolific in their songwriting. Number 11, Hey Yo, What You Do To Me. It was the final album to feature original keyboardist Bob Ashley, and despite the garage rock leanings, there's plenty of hints of what was to come as the band matured. Randy Bachman's songwriting was especially stronger this time around, and stylistically a little more varied. You can hear hints of Beatlemania on Stop Teasing Me, Dick Dale-esque influences on Made in England, and some of the band's future late 60s pop trends in Theme from a Music Box. Number 10. It's Time. While still very much a garage rock band here, it's a vital transition as original frontman Chad Allen would leave the band after the album's release, and keyboardist Burton Cummings would become the band's new face, so to speak. Randy Bachman's songwriting really comes into its own on this album, Cummings hands in a solid song of his own with seven long years, and the band's overall sound has a lot more crunch to it. 
Number 9, So Long Bannatine. Much like Wheatfield Soul, this album is an odd mishmash of styles. You have Barrel House, Heartland Rock, Doo-Wop, and even a few bizarre attempts at comedy rock. The album's title alludes to a lifestyle change for guitarist Kurt Winter, and the album does project an air of the band unsure of their direction. Not something you'd expect coming off a smash hit album like Share the Land. But instead of the album's quality suffering because of it, I actually think it thrives, with the stylistic changes keeping the album interesting even on its weakest tracks. Number 8, Road Food. Burton Cummings dominates the songwriting here, a marked change from previous albums where guitarist Kurt Winter was co-writing a lot of material. He'd leave the band after this album was recorded, as would Donnie McDougall. It's a bit sad that this lineup ended here. Much like with Bachman's departure after American Woman, we can only imagine what they could have gone on to do had Winter and McDougall stayed a little longer. The album does provide a few really solid songs, such as their last notable hit, Clap for the Wolfman, and the high-energy opener, Star Baby. Number 7, Rockin'. As I mentioned in a full-blown album review I did a few years ago for this, the music on this album definitely suggests the band was an early adopter of what would become the 50s revival sentiment that swept through pop culture in the 1970s. While the strongest material doesn't always stick to this, Guns 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 in particular, and a few of the lesser songs haven't aged all that well, there's still plenty to enjoy here. I wouldn't call it an album to start with while exploring their discography in detail, but it's still essential listening. Number 6, Artificial Paradise. As I said in a previous video, this album is an interesting collage of contrasts. The songwriting is so democratic, yet the band sounds so unified. And the album artwork both serves as a part of the album's critical and financial underperformance, and a perfect illustration of what the album really is, a hidden gem. Stylistically, it's another mixed bag. Rockers, ballads, and even a stab at world music with Hamagashla Usalangashla. The album has really grown on me ever since my first listen almost 10 years ago, and I highly recommend it. Number 5, Wheatfield Soul. This was the second of two albums I picked up during my college days, and despite the band having more or less the same lineup for several years leading up to this album, it still feels like a transitional one. This is especially evident in the stylistic shifts from song to song. Sure, there's plenty of 60s rock but you'll find psychedelia, pop, blues, and jazz as well. It does feel a bit like the band's still figuring out their own sound after shedding their garage rock chrysalis, so to speak. But this album's entertaining from start to finish. Number 4, Live at the Paramount. This is the only live album on this list. I'm honestly surprised more live material didn't get released during the band's heyday, given how much of a sonic powerhouse they were in person. The old material sounds amazing, while the new songs are welcome additions, even if studio-recorded versions never materialized in their catalog. I was lucky to get a CD copy of this album for a reasonably low price at a buy-sell-and-trade store, and I've loved it from the moment I first listened to it. It's definitely one of their best albums, and I highly recommend it. Number 3, Canned Wheat. While I feel this album isn't as strong as its immediate follow-up, it has a great ambiance to it. It's very much an improvement over Wheatfield's soul in terms of musical style, songwriting, and presentation. The last point being a bit ironic, given the band had hoped to re-record the bulk of the album in a different studio but didn't have the time to do so. I really like the approach the band took to linking many of the songs with brief musical interludes. I wish more artists did stuff like that. While the biggest numbers off this album are Undone and Laughing, I really like this album's versions of No Time and Of A Dropping Pin. Though I do have to wonder why they had a habit of re-recording some other songs. There's at least six examples of this throughout their discography. In any case, this is a truly great album. Number 2, Share the Land. The first album they put out after Randy Bachman left, and in a sense, a substitute album. You'd think that a personnel change like this would severely impact the album's quality, but in this case you'd be very wrong. Kurt Winter proved to be an excellent songwriter and the band's sound fleshed out greatly, with the hiring of both Winter and Greg Lesque as guitarists. Like the majority of the highest ranked albums on this list, I highly recommend this, even if you're not planning on buying a lot of Guess Who albums. Number 1, American Woman. This was the first Guess Who album I picked up. I was drawn to it for the hits and I stayed for the rest. 
and the overall quality just makes me wonder what the band could have gone on to be like had Randy Bachman stayed on for several more albums. The songwriting is of the band at its most solid, and the same goes for the musicianship. The band rocks their hardest overall, and the raw bite of the album continues to appeal to me. Well, that's it for this set of rankings. I hope to bring you some more soon.